here with us now, CNN senior legal analyst Ellie Hoding, CNN political commentator Errol Lewis, and assistant professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, Alexis Hogue Forger. Uh, professor, let me start with you because this phrase, willful retention of national defense information, evokes a couple very important Latin words in the legal profession, and they are... I hope you don't ask me to translate them. Um, I think what's key about the Espionage Act is that as, as lay people, I think it's this idea that uh, whoever is charged with that kind of crime needs to be some high-level spy, needs to be giving information out. But actually, the willful retention of documents, sensitive documents, is enough to constitute a crime. That's a pretty low threshold. And I think that underscores the fact that it might not just be Trump, but those surrounding him that, that could have violated federal law. I guess what I'm getting at, mens rea. What does that mean? Mens rea. So most crimes, all crimes require a mens rea, a mental state, and then an actus rea, some type of action. And so here, just the mere retention, hanging on to documents, knowing that someone had asked for them. This is, let's step back, an 18-month process, beginning with National Archives, noticing that certain documents were missing, requesting those documents. People in Trump's camp saying, OK, we've got a few documents. Here you go. That's all the documents. But it wasn't. And so here we have the federal government, Department of Justice, having to subpoena information. And then, of course, now we know uh, it, issuing a warrant to search the president's residence. He's just saying, no, I'm not going to turn this over. Yes, I know what they are. Yes, I know that you want them. No, I'm not turning them over. That's really the gist of, of this charge. Alexis makes a couple good points. First of all, as a prosecutor, you don't shoot for the highest possible statute. You don't have to go right to the James Bond stuff if there's an easier way to get there. And this, uh, the description of the crime that we now see mm -hmm. in, in this document, willful retention of national defense information, that's the easiest way to prove it. That's smart strategy and willful. Yeah, willful just means knowing what you're doing and understanding the illegal nature of it here. Another important point, though, these, they're not charges yet, but these alleged crimes that underlie the search warrant, they're not specific as to any person. So when you get a search warrant, you don't have to go to a judge and say, we believe Errol Lewis, sorry, Errol, Errol Lewis committed these crimes. But you say, you have to say, you sort of phrase it in the Nixonian passive voice. We believe that these crimes were committed. Now, I think it's Donald Trump's residence, but it could be anybody as well. There are those who are reading into this, though, Ellie, and when they say the willful, see the willful retention of national defense information, they think that somehow implies Donald Trump's will yeah. and the the physical you know actuality of it being national defense information he was the only one who could have possessed it so they see that maybe focusing in more on him specifically i think that's very logical i mean he would be the first person who comes to my mind and who calls the shots about hey those documents are coming or those documents are getting sent back i think it stands to reason and it would shock me if it's anybody but donald trump so the basis for the search and there's check boxes in this new document released it doesn't include that the information was intended for use or used in committing a crime. And I wonder if that gives Donald Trump, at least, you know, when it comes to optics, something to hang his hat on. I was just holding on to these. Well, it's entirely possible. And there, there was some reporting, some good reporting about how he was very proud of the letters that he got from Kim Jong-un, that he liked to show it around. You know, I got a letter from a head of state, uh, this sort of a thing. Uh, he could try that as an alibi, but as Alexa said, I mean, the, the law doesn't really allow for that. You read through the, the wording of the statute, it says even if you lawfully possessed it, you can be in violation of the law because once, they, once a, a credible authority asks for it back and you refuse to do it, you're off in some other territory. And I think that's what we're going to probably find the government trying to, the, the Department of Justice trying to establish. Um, w whatever Donald Trump is going to say, I mean, it's been this, you know, moving target, right? I mean, first he said the FBI planted it. Uh, you know, then they, they've attempted in the last few days, I hope this goes away, they've attempted this ludicrous uh, uh, idea that everything gets declassified automatically yes. the minute you take it out of the White House because Donald Trump said so, even though there's not a scrap of paper anywhere to memorialize that or, or to justify it. Errol, it just so happens that <laughs> CNN has some reporting on that very subject. <laughs> Jamie Gangel and her team talked to 18 former officials in and around the inner workings of the White House when Donald Trump was there. And they all say the same thing. There was no standing order to declassify. John Bolton, the former national security advisor on this show, said it's a complete fiction. In the article, Jamie's article, it includes quotes from John Kelly, former chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, former chief of staff. These are people who would necessarily know 
that's about right. us that's anymore. Right. right. Olivia Troy, the yeah. national security advisor to Vice President Pence. All of them are saying on the record, this didn't happen. This couldn't happen, you know, which is, I guess, more to the point that you, you can't say that something is going to be classified in Washington, D.C., but once you put it on a plane and take it to his vacation home, now it's declassified. It just doesn't even make sense. Uh, and, and to the extent that the, the, the president does have broad declassification powers, those don't exist in a vacuum. You have to tell somebody. You have to tell the National Security Advisor. You have to tell the CIA. You have to tell somebody that this document is declassified because that's the meaning of it, is that everybody in the government knows that this uh, document has been moved from one category to the next. Which makes it clear that's not a real legal defense. That's just about a message that he's putting out to his supporters. It's just for optics. Exactly. And I think what's really important to note is that even if the president had declassified this information, if that was actually a policy, it wouldn't make a difference in terms of defense to the Espionage Act, which, again, as we opened with, is that it's just uh, constitutes the willful retention of essentially sensitive information. It doesn't have to have a specific categorization. Um, and so the declassification is immaterial to whether or not uh, Trump or anyone in his camp violated federal law. The same goes for all three laws exactly. that they list, by the way. That may have been intentional. All right, I want to bring up a different investigation. <laughs> and this is in Georgia, where the Fulton County DA, Fonnie Willis, is looking into Donald Trump and people associated with him, their efforts to overturn the election results in Georgia. The Georgia governor, Brian Kemp, has been subpoenaed to a bef he appear before this grand jury. He's fighting that subpoena. He doesn't want to do it because he says at this point, this investigation is political and is pretty close to his re-election battle. His opponent, Stacey Abrams, talked about this last night. Let's listen to what she said. If you look at the emails that have been released about the back and forth and having dealt with the Kemp administration, I would actually put my faith more in the Fulton County DA's office. I know that this has been a meticulous and very thoughtful investigation, and that he is not the only Republican who's tried to skirt his responsibility to provide information. Ellie? So I did a double take when I heard that last night on Aaron Burnett's show, and, and Stacey Abrams said the same thing later in the show. She said it twice. This is a meticulous investigation by the DA's office. How on earth would Stacey Abrams know that? Stacey Abrams is a civilian, no different than any of us. She's not a public official. She's not part of the prosecutor's office. So there's two possibilities here. One, which I hope it's not, it better not be, is she's being briefed on this behind the scenes by the prosecutor's office. That would be wildly inappropriate, all sorts of cross wires, politics, and prosecution. The other is she made it up. There's sort of a middle ground here where she's rooting for this investigation. And let's keep in mind, Brian Kemp, her upcoming opponent in the gubernatorial race, has received a subpoena. He's now in a battle with Fonnie Willis. And to me, this sort of underscores that there are real political problems going on here. And we're starting to see politics infect this investigation. Not long ago, a judge in Georgia disqualified Fonnie Willis from one of her subpoenas. He said, you have a political conflict of interest. He said something along the lines of, I don't know what you were thinking. She had done a fundraiser for the political opponent of someone who she had subpoenaed. And now when it comes to Brian Kemp, Kemp's argument is, you, the DA, have politicized this by waiting so long. And the fact is, the DA shot back hard. But the reality is, the DA took a year and a half from January, this tape, the Raffensperger tape came out in January of 2021 until this summer to see the grand jury, a couple months before that election. Now, Fonnie Willis says, you're the one stalling Brian Kemp. He got subpoenaed three weeks ago. So who's more to blame here, the year and a half delay or the three week resistance? That comes down to this investigation. Is the legitimacy of it threatened here? Is it politicized? Whatever the outcome, are there going to be questions around it? Well, there are going to be questions. I mean, there, it, it's grinding to a halt, frankly. And, and this is, look, this is part of what comes from having elected prosecutors, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there are other yeah. systems around the world where they don't do it this way. Uh, but for F Fannie Willis to uh, go to a fundraiser, which is what an elected official does, that's sort of her night job. Meanwhile, the day job is, is now going to be sort of uh, imperiled, in part because the, the integrity of it can't, you know, I mean, it has to be questioned, you know? So... so Look, Brian Kemp has a point. Some of this could be negotiated. One would hope that all of these public servants, who, after all, the taxpayers are, you know, funding their salaries, that they would sit down with a bunch of lawyers and they would say, look, this is what we'll do. This is what we're not going to do. This is what we'll talk about. What information do you need? Um, maybe we'll do written interrogatories. But, you know, you, you, we, you've got to make sure that the investigation, which is more important than any of these individual officials, is done properly. Uh, the, you know, there's something really serious here. This fake elector scheme, the president's lawyer being deposed, 
of the sitting governor being subpoenaed. It's really, really serious stuff. I think Fannie Willis may have been off more than she can chew. Errol Lewis, Ellie Honing, Professor, thank you all so much for being with us this morning.